Good afternoon. My name is Joanne Kilgour, and I'm the executive director of the Ohio River Valley Institute. Thanks so much for joining us this morning, well, this afternoon now. Um, as we wait for everyone to join, I want to cover just a couple of technical notes um, about this session. The first is that we are recording so that anyone who is not able to attend live will have access to the recording after the fact. Um, in addition, we've enabled the closed caption function for accessibility, so there should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enable that function if you'd like to see live captions. Um, I'd like to extend a thanks to Ben Hunkler, the communications manager for the Ohio River Valley Institute, who's coordinated this event and who's on today in case you have any technical issues with the meeting. So again, for those who are just joining, we are recording. Thank you so much for being here. The format of today's event will begin with a presentation of findings <clears throat> from the research team, followed by a brief panel discussion. After the panel discussion, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. So if you do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A or chat functions. And I'll do my best to see that we get through as many questions as we can in the time allotted. If there are any questions that we do not have time to address during the event, we will be sure to follow up with you directly. So thank you again for joining today as we release a new report titled Updated Economics for Virgin Plastics, Appalachian Petrochemicals Production, Capacity Growth Prospects Dimming as Global Markets Shift. This is an update to our November 2021 report titled Poor Economics for Virgin Plastics. Today's report details that the global petrochemical industry is facing a severe cycle low raising serious questions about the viability of new petrochemical development in Appalachia and the profitability of Shell's new Pennsylvania ethane cracker, which announced partial opening earlier this fall. We're honored to be joined today by the authors of this report, Kathy Hippel and Ann Keller. Thank you all again for joining us. And now I'm very pleased to turn the mic over to Kathy Hippel. Well, thank you very much, Joanne. It's a pleasure to be um, speaking to all of this uh, group of participants. And I'd like to give a thanks again to Orvi and to my co-author, Ann Keller, on this. Um, my interest in the petrochemical industry actually grew out of an interest I've had in the oil and gas industry, particularly the Appalachian so-called uh, gas producers, what we sometimes call uh, Appalachian mm -hmm. frackers. And initially there was a problem, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to uh, present this as a story. Um, there was too much ethane in the natural gas in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. It's considered to be wet natural gas, which is different from liquefied natural gas or natural gas liquid. Ethane is a natural gas liquid and natural gas in Appalachia has an awful lot of it. So the question was, what do they do with this ethane rich gas? And the solution was plastics. So we have a snippet of what was said to Dustin Hoffman in the famous graduate uh, movie. So the idea is that they were going to build a number of petrochemical plants in that area to use ethane as a feedstock to produce polyethylene. And that um, led to this idea there would be many of these so-called ethane crackers. And um, many plans were put forth by companies. We've looked at them. One was PTT <laughs> Global, which you might have heard of. They were planning to do something in Ohio. It looks like that is on permahold. Um, a Brazilian company was very seriously considering that. Two other smaller companies were considering this. They did not follow through. In fact, only Shell has come forward. So the once imagined massive build out of this region for many petrochemical plants came down to only one that has moved forward to date. And we believe only one will move forward because the reason that Shell moved forward is that they had many research reports suggesting 
that it could create massive economic benefits for the region. Um, these were done by professors from Robert Morris University. They were not endorsed by Robert Morris University, but they were financed by Shell. So Shell financed these reports um, and the professors suggested there would be tremendous economic benefits. The studies have been criticized, but they were used in support of moving forward. But the key reason that Shell did move forward was, and it's been admitted by Shell executives, were the massive subsidies that were provided. Um, here's a, a particularly great quote on the record. I can tell you with hand to my heart that without these fiscal incentives, we would not have made this investment decision. So that's what a Shell executive said in 2016. It's important to note that they were looking at doing this back in 2012 and in 2012 and then moving forward to 2014, much has changed since then. So um, at one point when all of these other companies were considering it, they thought there would be such a massive build out of petrochemical facilities that they would even need a storage hub for all of the ethane that that would be produced because ethane crackers cannot be turned on and turned off easily. So you need a constant supply of ethane. And they thought Shell had solved that problem, but what about all these other petrochemical companies that might want to move in and build ethane, um, ethane crackers in the area? They would need an underground storage hub like exists in other parts of the country on the Gulf, for example. Um, in fact, um, many industry boosters came along in support of that. And even the Department of Energy back in 2018 suggested this need for an ethane storage hub. So what has happened since those early days and what is the situation right now for the Shell Cracker plant and what does it portend going forward? I will turn it over to petrochemicals analyst, Ann Keller and the co-author of this report to lead us through this. Ann, I think you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to be here with everyone today. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I've been involved in this issue since uh, well prior to the, cons the uh, investment decision for the Shell plant when a producer in Appalachia came to, uh, to me to discuss op options for expanding their production in the face of finding out that they had a considerable amount of ethane in the gas that they weren't able to put into the existing pipeline system. Excuse me. <clears throat> so some of the things that we looked at at the time, because there, the ethylene plant that had been in Appalachia during the conventional boom was no longer in Charleston. It had been shut down and the site had been sold to Dow Chemical years before. So we looked at ideas such as blending gas with lower ethane content into the, the gas that, that they had that has high ethane so that they could continue to use the pipeline system that was there. And that actually was done in subsequent years, especially when uh, wells were discovered in Ohio that had large volumes of so-called dry gas. That was, that was one opportunity. Another one that was identified was the idea of using ethane as power generation fuel to run the facilities at the gas processing plants as well as to generate power in the region. And uh, that has been done too, not, not to significant scale. It wasn't enough to, to resolve the entire issue and allow the producers to continue drilling, but it did move some of the ethane that the individual producers had. The problem at the time was that coal-fired uh, coal power was still so much less costly than uh, gas-fired power uh, back before the big boom that we've seen recently that, that that wasn't considered to be an economic solution. And that started, kicked off a discussion of other things to do with ethane, which of course, as Kathy said, 
uh, was the petrochemical solution. So uh, we had a lot of, uh, there was a lot of activity then around developing a project and Shell stepped forward first to make an investment decision in 2012 and uh, to select the site at Manaka to begin construction. But still, as you've seen, these plants can take a long time, especially when they're on sites that have never had ethylene plants and when you have to put in infrastructure to bring the feedstock to the site as well as to uh, remove the, the petrochemical products that they produce. So while the shell plant was being built, we still had an issue of what to do with the ethane. And the midstream companies, uh, of course, being the entrepreneurial source that they are, were working with the producers to resolve the problem as well. And since their, their position in the industry is as the go-between that moves product from the wellhead to the market, their, their idea involved pipeline transportation. <coughs> Sorry about that. Everything except ethane can be moved uh, by truck or rail if necessary. It's expensive, but possible. So ethane was really the, uh, the product that we were focusing on in terms of uh, handling it was pipelines. And there happened to be some existing pipelines in the region that uh, either handled refined products or in the case of the ATEX project that were handling propane that was coming from the US Gulf Coast to the Northeast when uh, the heating market there demanded so much additional product in the winter. But as production grew in the Northeast, the need for propane uh, exports, if you will, from the Gulf Coast uh, decreased and a project was put forward to convert one of one piece of those pipelines into an ethane project <clears throat> to move ethane into the U.S. Gulf Coast chemical market. That was the ATEX line. And then the Nova Ethylene facility in Sarnia decided to convert their site from using a multiple uh, number of feedstocks to ethane only. And at that time, Sunoco began to convert uh, what they now call their Mariner system from refined product service to ethane service. And the first one of those lines that, that uh, went into operation around 2014 was the Mariner West line that was set up to move ethane from southwestern Pennsylvania to Nova in Sarnia. That was followed by conversion of the existing refined products line going from Pennsylvania to uh, the export facility and refining complex at Marcus Hook, which was called Mariner East. And uh, then Sunoco, uh, of course, added additional pipeline capacity, including two more lines, the last of which is Mariner East 2X, which was recently finally put into service after a number of delays involving um, uh, construction issues and environmental permitting. We also had a Utopia line, which followed the pathway of the Mariner West system to move ethane from Ohio again and West Virginia to an expanded site uh, that NOVA operates in Sarnia. So over the course of the years between when Shell decided to build their plan in the first place and when it's finally started up, the excess ethane that was originally um, considered to be the attractive lure for the petrochemical industry was basically drained away and moved to other markets, including overseas, because the Mariner lines going from Pennsylvania to Marcus Hook were able to use existing infrastructure that existed at that site for underground storage and um, NGL loading to move uh, ethane to other locations in Europe where the chemical plants at those sites had run out of ethane feedstock because of declines in production in the North Sea. So uh, now we have a distribution grid that's, that's uh, handling the ethane to take it to other locations. So the impetus to, uh, to build a petrochemical plant in the region was, uh, was slowly being drained away, if you were, because the producers needed to execute contracts with the pipeline systems for anywhere from 10 to 15 years in order to justify the investment that was required to expand the systems. And that effectively took those ethane barrels out of the market for uh, future domestic, uh, for regional feedstock supply for ethylene. We can move to, I think we can move to the next. 
So the other problem here is in addition to having enough pipelines to move the ethane out of the region, the uh, ethane supply isn't necessarily growing either. Even though natural gas production is still on a growth trajectory in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, although at a lower level of growth than what had originally been anticipated with gas pipeline takeaway, that hasn't happened. Uh, in Ohio, natural gas production as a whole has been declining since 2016. And more relevant to the ethylene industry and, and folks who would like to see additional development in that regard, the amount of gas that's going through gas processing facilities for NGL extraction for really anything, including ethane, has been falling. So overall NGL supply is declining. That uh, is probably another reason why PTT decided to, to turn to developing other opportunities in the chemical industry in that region. So bottom line, and during the 10 years while Shell was working on their plant, um, other markets were found and the volumes of ethane that were expected originally to be sort of stranded within the region and uh, potentially available at a below market price that would support uh, the economics of ethylene construction in an area that didn't have a lot of infrastructure were, were uh, dwindling. In addition, uh, Shell also had access to storage facilities and, and uh, consumption capacity on the U.S. Gulf Coast that they were able to use while their plant was under construction. And this wasn't available to the, to the other players that were looking at projects. <clears throat> so now the, the situation overall in North America is that because of all the excitement over low cost ethane in both Appalachia and the rest of the United States, given the rapid growth in natural gas and, and ethane supply, we are once again in an overbuilt situation. And I say once again, because this industry tends to be very cyclical uh, when margins uh, expand and GDP is growing and the economy is doing well, Usually everyone is very optimistic and makes plans to expand their businesses, but of course the challenge is if they do it all at once, you have a situation such as we're facing now that's made even worse or more challenging than it typically is by the fact that we're looking at potential slowdowns in the demand for this product, not necessarily because the economy is never going to recover, or because people are never going to need or use additional materials and plastics uh, that the, these products are used for, but simply because we're looking at sustainability, we're looking at issues around recycling and the need to reuse the material that we have, because the bottom line is uh, we've thrown away so much of our trash that we're starting to literally drown in it. So here's the challenge that the industry is facing in one chart. So uh, very big thanks to John Richardson of ISIS, <clears throat> excuse me, ICIS. Uh, that, that acronym is, has been problematic over the last few years. This is a, a chemical analytic service. And they're forecasting that this excess capacity is going to more than double. So we're going to have an overhang if we don't, if we try to run all the facilities that we currently have on the ground. This figure shows uh, global capacity, which of course is representative of the petrochemical market because it is a global market. The producers seek to make their raw materials in the regions that offer them the best uh, combination of transportation logistics and uh, low cost feedstock, which is the key driver for siting a, a plant in the first place. <laughs> <clears throat> High density polyethylene is what we've chosen to show here because it is probably the most common commodity chemical product that is made by these primary ethylene uh, cracker facilities and uh, definitely will be a large part of the shell plants production. So what you're seeing here on the left hand side is just simply uh, capacity, the production capacity for this material. Then you're looking at the demand, which are which is the orange bar, and that's on the right hand side. And you obviously can see that the blue bars are exceeding the orange bars as we go through the balance of the decades. So we're over capacity. 
The important thing for a petrochemical industry observer to note, though, is the capacity utilization, which is known as the operating rate. So how much of your facility are you actually running? And you'll see here at the bottom in the very fine print that for the last 20 years, that average was about 88%. <clears throat> That's considered pretty good because generally something in the high 80s to low 90s indicates that you're using a lot of the facilities you have. And of course, you wouldn't keep running them if they weren't profitable. So uh, that's that's a pretty good metric. But then we see in the next, let's say the next three to five years, we're looking at potentially as low as 78% next year, uh, rising to perhaps 80%. And that would be the 78% the lowest rate we've seen since 2000, which was definitely a, a bottom for the industry. <clears throat> and a level at which uh, chemical plant operators will have to look at uh, at least temporarily idling, less profitable capacity while they uh, wait to see if the economy will recover. Then in uh, between now and the end of the decade, 22 to 30, the entire next seven to eight years, the average is, is potentially going to be as low as 81%. Keep in mind, the math is done based on keeping what we have open in service and seeing how that looks. And what they're trying to point out here from, a, from an analyst standpoint is that that's really too low. And if demand really does shake out the way these charts are showing, we're going to be seeing companies look at, at uh, taking at least parts of their plants out of service. Where that happens, of course, depends on what the price of oil and gas uh, will be over time, how those relate, and the other factors within the, the home markets. But what we do know is that the big driver of demand for the last 20 years that's been behind a lot of this growth has been China because of a lot of the outsourcing that's been done of manufacturing to uh, the Chinese producers. So we've been sending for a long time, we've sent feedstock to China. Uh, we've sent, I'm sorry, we've sent plastics to China and they sent things back to us in uh, large containers. And recently we started actually exporting the feedstock. So uh, China, like you know, most of us would like to keep more of the value chain within their country. They have been expanding their own production capacity, and our ethylene producers were targeting the ability to continue to export material to China because their costs were low due to the lower cost ethane feedstock that we have here, and because of the expectation that global demand for this virgin plastic would increase at the same rate it has for the last 20 years. But because of all the issues that we know about with, with uh, around single-use plastics, around uh, the desire of the consumer now to use recycled materials, that assumption is being challenged. And the Chinese demand for our materials is also being challenged. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, some of the scenarios that we've seen for Chinese demand uh, Apart from this past year, when we've had the issue of their, their targeting COVID zero, which has shut down a lot of their industrial facilities, uh, even going forward, the analysts are saying that, that we're looking at a trough in demand. And of course, again, the last 20 years are not going to be predictive of the next 20. So the, the demand rates that we were looking at, the absorption rates we were looking at as exporters of ethylene, are looking uh, considerably more optimistic than we would have thought before the pandemic. And the advice to um, commodity ethylene exporters is that they need to, to see what they can do besides exporting to China as a, a market strategy. <clears throat> now, I, I know that one of the advantages of putting the shell facility in Manaka was that the uh, plastics wouldn't have so far to travel to reach the, the end use consumer market within the region. And that's definitely true. So that could prove to be an advantage for this facility because it's positioned in, in front of a, a considerable amount of North American demand. But of course the challenge is that they're one player in a global market and it's kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. The, the pounds that were being provided to this market from other producers in the United States are now going to be seeking another home unless those facilities end up having to be rationalized. 
because they can't sell to China anymore. So now you have kind of a, a circle going on to see, uh, uh, you know, how how long you can keep your capacity open, regardless of which plant manages to uh, to be successful. And further for uh, future development prospects, it would be challenging to see another ethylene uh, company want to come into the region and repeat and replicate the exercise of, of putting in new facilities when you have challenges around future availability of feedstock and then this overhang from, uh, from market surplus going on for the next 10 years. And really the region doesn't need to wait 10 years and work 10 years to get a facility when there are other things that, that would probably produce more, uh, uh, more results in the very near future. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, I think just looking at Shell's own chemical um, earnings, it will amplify uh, and build on what Anne just walked us through. And um, Shell does not, like some of its competitors, Sassel, for example, it does not break down on a per plant basis. The cost, the number that is often thrown out is six billion to build this facility, but we have no proof that that is in fact what they spent. They may have spent much more than that. Um, so they don't break things down, but they do break their chemical segment down. So um, just looking at it, and the key thing to note here is this capacity utilization. Um, 2022 has been a very bad year in terms of segment earnings. Um, they've taken losses in the second and third quarter. The first quarter, as the world economy was coming out of the COVID and it was a huge economic expansion, chemical margins were good, capacity utilization was high, it was quite profitable, but the bottom really did drop out somewhere in the second quarter. Um, they've experienced losses and even probably more of concern is that their capacity utilization has gone below that 80% number. Um, it's only been, um, if you look at 2021, it was 87%. 2022 through the first uh, nine months has been 79%. And it really does speak volumes that this facility is coming online. It's only partially online, as you know, right now, but it's coming online at a very difficult time, which is why we have come to the conclusion that it is unlikely to be nearly as profitable as once had been anticipated and other companies looking to potentially build a pet petrochemical facility would be wise to uh, consider that we're in an overbuild boom bust cycle. We're currently in the cycle low, we believe, and that could extend, especially if the world goes into a worldwide depression or not depression, recession, please excuse that. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, so how does this affect the region? Um, just sort of zooming out for a moment. Um, the region has been hit by a tremendous amount of problems with the nat natural gas producers over the last 10 years. They have um, consistently recorded negative cash flows, but the last year has been much, much better as natural gas prices have gone up. Um, but the region is having difficulty growing. Natural gas producers face um, takeaway constraints. Um, pipelines have, about five of them have been canceled. Their last hope for moving significant amounts of natural gas beyond the region was the Mountain Valley pipeline. It has continued to be mired in legal issues and um, so they are, in a sense, um, landlocked with a lot of production uh, capacity, but they're unable to get it beyond the region. So production growth was forecast to be much higher. It looks like it's going to be only about 1%. 
the takeaway constraints have not been solved and they're unlikely to be solved anytime soon. So many of the producers are looking beyond the region. They might be buying um, gas assets in other basins, or they could be looking at blue hydrogen as a potential solution, which is um, all the buzz and all the rage at the moment. So in conclusion, um, we do think that policymakers and local people focused on economic revitalization, economic development, should shift their focus from virgin plastic production to other avenues. Um, PTTGCA's recent decision to create a plastics recycling business instead of moving forward with its virgin plastic ethylene cracker is an indication that the industry agrees with our assessment. So with that, I, um, I will turn it back to Joanne for questions. Great, thank you so much. So thank you, Kathy and Anne, for your research and for being with us here today to present. Um, we do have a few questions, but I'd like to start just with some kind of framing um, big picture questions. And Kathy, you alluded to this in the last slide, um, but you know, if you were a local resident of Appalachia who'd been promised prosperity from the petrochemical industry and its supporters, what would you want the main takeaway from this new research to be? I would say don't believe the, um, the economic hype um, that is often promised. We have seen over and over again that when a facility is moving into a, um, a new location, they, the, the industry often will pay researchers to do very robust economic analysis. And they use something called economic multipliers that are unrealistic often. They sometimes mischaracterize what the project will produce. And they suggest that there'll be these tremendous amounts of economic benefits that flow through to the local residents. And what we've discovered, and I think Orby's done a tremendous amount of research on this topic, is that very little of it comes down to the local level. Um, and there are many reasons for that, but sometimes people get very excited that there will be job development, there'll be a whole hub created, that we can recreate the glory days of the steel industry. And in fact, we have found that basically with the fracking revolution in the Ohio River Valley, that it really has not trickled down to the lower level. Um, what we've also discovered is often um, the pollution impacts, the environmental impacts, which are well covered by others, are greater than the industry has forecast. And I think we've seen that just in the last two weeks with the partial opening of the plant is that you really do have to weigh it beyond an economic decision and, and, and look at more of a holistic view on whether this is the best avenue forward for the region. Great. And is there anything you'd like to add before we move on to additional questions? Um, I guess it's uh, what we're saying here is that it's taken 10 years and over a billion and a half dollars of taxpayer money to bring in what amounts to currently a relative handful of jobs. There may be a few more added, I think. I'm not disagreeing that there would be, but right now we have the plant running and maybe six, 600 jobs or so, which is kind of what was promised. That seems like a fairly high price. And you know, after, after mm -hmm. 10 years of waiting and working to land this facility, it seems like it might be better to turn time and attention to ways that could bring in maybe smaller projects, but projects that would bring results in faster than 10 years, because that's half a generation. And I really don't think that the people here feel like they have, you know, half a generation to wait while, while something's put together. They want to see that, that there's opportunity now. So um, 
you know, they sound good. They sound good when they're announced, but if they can't be uh, realized fairly quickly, it's kind of challenging to see who's really benefiting in the region. It's not the people that are currently living here. So, Great. Thank you. Um, so we have already received quite a few questions in the Q&A and the chat. So um, I think we can move on to starting to address those. The first comes from John Detweiler. Um, and John asks, can the big drop in capacity utilization be due to the opening of the Manaka plant, i.e. the denominator is suddenly bigger, but the numerator is the same? Uh, I, I posted an answer to that to him, I think. I, I don't believe it's in the chart that I'm showing here, even though that chart was produced in the last couple of weeks. It's possible. It's in their numbers, but it, it'll have some of that effect. But uh, one of the big pieces here is that we had some plants on the Gulf Coast that have already shut down capacity for anywhere from a month to two to three months uh, because they were either moving up turnarounds, quote unquote, or because they just simply said margins don't justify uh, continuing to produce at these rates. So that's really, I think, what's what's driving what you're seeing. This is a big chunk of capacity, but it, it's not going to be that big a piece of this statistic. Thank you. Um, and then the next question comes from Sandy Field. And that question is, does the overbuilt situation for ethane also affect the viability of the prospects for energy production using renewables. I don't really see those as relating necessarily. Um, no, I, I don't see somebody delaying a renewables project because there's a way to move ethane out of the region. As, as Kathy, I think, mentioned in the report, and we're trying to keep the press conference under a certain time limit, so without expanding on it a lot. As she mentioned in the report, the ethane problem was originally the issue that was challenging the ENP industry in their expansion desires initially. That's effectively been resolved for now, we think, but the challenge now is, is a little bit deeper. They're having trouble finding ways to move the gas out of the region. And, um, so if anything, that's that's really your challenge now is the whole natural gas situation and the pipeline situation more so than than I think. Great. Um, the next question comes from Kathy Ann Kowalski, um, and this is a two part question. So I'll start with the first part, and that is, um, could you provide a bit more detail on the PTTGC decision? Will the recycling facility be on the property that Jobs Ohio spent millions on or somewhere else? And would building and operating that kind of site provide the same number of jobs for construction and operation phases without requiring the same pipeline and other infrastructure? Um, I can start with the answer. It is not on the same site as I understand it. And we have not done a full life cycle analysis on a plastic recycling plant versus virgin plastics, but you know, back of the envelope, I would think that it would, uh, it would, it would make sense. But, but again, I think you would need a full jobs analysis um, to look into that, and to again weigh that against the public health benefits of a virgin plastics facility. Um, the PTT global facility will be outside of Columbus, Ohio. Um, the initial PTDG site that they had already cleared a lot of the land for was going to be in Dilly's Bottom. Great. As for uh, the job creation, these uh, the good news, I think, for these facilities, because uh, we're doing a lot of work on that, of course, on the Gulf Coast, because we make the plastics, and they've just announced uh, Lexon and Lyondale have just announced the startup of a $100 million facility that's literally designed to uh, create chemical feedstocks from recycled plastic, which is kind of the beginning. So one, you see on the investment side, 100 million versus a you know, jillion billion like the Shell plant. <laughs> on the other hand, you know, when we were talking about smaller scale, it's up and running in less than a year. 
So there is something to think about there. Uh, so on construction, no, not so much. On the other hand, as you know, construction jobs are generally not local because uh, the people have specialized skill sets and they tend to be kind of like uh, mobile. They, they're mobile from project to project. So you have the issue of a lot of people for a while that don't stay because the jobs aren't the sort of work that they do permanently. Uh, permanent jobs, uh, probably, you know, it'd be hard to say in terms of number of jobs per 100 million invested, but let's say the Shell facility ended up costing, you know, let's let's say it cost $6 billion. I, I don't, I have no information on what the ultimate build cost was, but let's say it was, and divide that by 600 jobs, and that's a fair chunk of change in terms of capital per job. And um, the facilities that we're talking about here, they won't require as many people, but on the other hand, something to think about is that they aren't a, a situation where you have people in, uh, you know, protective suits picking through people's trash. Those facilities aren't that anymore. So if you have that image, wipe that away. These are highly automated. The uh, the process of separating the pieces and parts to feed them into the units to create the feedstocks are pretty amazing. There's, uh, you know, we, we've kind of heaped, heaped uh, scorn on Europe for their energy policy recently, but in terms of the advances they've made in handling uh, waste, they are way ahead of us, you know, whether good, ill, however you want to look at it, but the facilities there are very modern. The jobs there involve a lot of uh, work like automation, uh, optical, optical work, sensors, uh, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, not so I think in terms of, of jobs per hundred million dollars of investment, I think once you actually work and do some math, I think you'll find that they could be probably uh, cheaper on a per job basis than something like this in these ethylene facilities because they're just a lot of materials ultimately. Thank you. Um, I know that this report was looking more into the petrochemical and plastics um, sector, but the second part of Kathy's question is, do you have a sense of why natural gas production in Ohio has been declining, and would it be likely to go up again if natural gas prices remain high? Um, I don't have a sense. I think it's an excellent question, Kathy Ann. I know that in Pennsylvania, the producers, I'm more familiar with the uh, companies uh, with their primary production in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, and they had forecasted uh, higher production levels than they have actually managed to obtain this year. Um, and many of them are looking beyond the region. Uh, um, the ones that have doubled down on the region have often hedged. I don't know if you know too much about that, but what they've done is they've said, we've experienced such low prices for such a long time. They wanna protect on the downside, but what's happened then is they take these big losses when the natural gas prices have doubled or tripled, or in some cases um, been very volatile. So they've experienced a lot of losses. So I don't know if, if price is what will motivate them to produce more or if they have just determined a lot of what they're talking about now in the whole natural gas industry, especially in that region, is something called capital discipline. And the market said that they had been losing money for so many years and they kept spending money and building more and more and longer and longer wells, but they were not making profits. So the industry really punished them. And as a result now, they're quite, they keep talking about capital discipline, not spending as much to expand their production. And that may be the driving factor for the Ohio producers, but I simply don't know the answer for sure. I think uh, some people are waiting to see the results of EOG's activity. They recently announced acquisition of a significant amount of acreage in Ohio to chase what they were calling the oil window 10 or, 10 or 15 years ago. There was a significant amount of drilling done there uh, back during that time in search of something other than, <laughs> other than natural gas. <clears throat> So we'll see how the geology turns out there, but yet, of course, they're looking for oil. Um, 
one of the things that Ohio had going on recent in recent years anyway was the discovery of a large number of high production wells that some of which set records for their first day volume in the region. That again was dry gas, which is why we're saying that the amount of, of gas that's going through processing plants is lower because this gas was not high in GL. And the producers uh, uh, had a lot of success with that and were happy because of course they could blend it with their richer gas and not have to, to put in as much processing capacity. But again, in the last six years, we've, we've definitely seen declines as those wells have kind of tapered off and um, the appetite to, to drill more has kind of waned. And I think uh, a, a lot of that, or at least some, a, a large part of it, has something to do with this takeaway issue. Uh, that one big segment of the Mountain Valley pipeline is a relatively small piece of the whole system, but it blocks the, the entire egress of a piece of that gas. And until that's resolved, it's going to be challenging to, to really ramp production in some of those areas. Great. Um, we did have one question posed in the chat that I, I think might be more of a comment um, from Ginny McNeil um, asking about balancing economic development and public health risks. And at the um, hopefully you'll extend me the courtesy of letting me editorialize a little bit, even though I'm more of the moderator than panelist. Um, but I just wanted to say, I think, you know, part of our hope in releasing this report is to help make the case that even when we talk about things like balancing economic mm -hmm. development and public health, climate or environmental risk, mm -hmm. often the starting point is wrong to begin with because we're using kind of trumped up assumptions about what, those econ what the economic development side looks like. So part of what we're hoping to contribute is as we're thinking through um, future decision making and evaluating and holding accountable decision makers for past decisions, I think we mm -hmm. want to be clear and informed about the reality of the economic development side of that equation. So, um, Ginny, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's if that's helpful or not, but um, I think you know that's part of what we're hoping people will take away from um, these two reports held together. Um, because it is a body of work that's intended to influence that, um, that thinking. Um, Kathy, I think one, of the, ahead, one Kathy. other point just to add on to that in terms of economic development decisions, um, there are industries poised for growth. And then there are industries that naturally are not at the growth stage. And to, it, you know, things look very different in 2012. And since then, we've really reconsidered plastic waste in a very big way. Um, countries that accepted large amounts of US plastic no longer do. There have been huge um, issues. We've really done a great job in the report, I think, describing all these um, decisions by big companies no longer to use virgin plastics. There's been a reckoning so the question is, do you want to tie an industry to, or do you want to tie a region to producing something that we need to produce less of overall? We need to recycle and reuse plastic rather than just have an endless supply of making virgin plastic. So that's more of a broader question. And we think the finances and the economics don't support that decision. I think that that's a great point, Kathy. Um, like uh, my specialty is midstream chemical feedstocks and, and the petrochemical industry. So I'm not anti petrochemicals or anti materials or anti advancement in quality of life. So it's not about that. It's as we were saying, it's about the economic issues that, that are associated with this. If the economics only makes sense, if the taxpayer is tapped to effectively pay for their own jobs, it's hard to see how you would call that uh, in the interest of the public, really. It's, it's you know, again, it's like, it's like um, the argument we're having as a country in some cases, you know, one group gets money, the other group is, is uh, providing the money one way or the other. I think the goal is economic advancement in something that makes economic sense. And as Shell pointed out, uh, 
a lot of their decision making was supported really by two things. One, a subsidy, which effectively covers their payroll for the next 20 years. And the other one was the fact that they were able to uh, make agreements with producers for feedstock supply that they weren't going to be using for anywhere from five to 10 years because they had businesses elsewhere. So the region was, was attractive to them, but when they tried to expand that out to create a hub like the Gulf Coast as kind of a hedge you know, against hurricanes and, and all the other fun things we had going on here, uh, the issue came up, the other companies didn't have a way to secure their feedstock from the producers and let the producers continue with their business while they were under construction on projects that can take anywhere from three to five, or in this case, 10 years to come to fruition. And, and so uh, you're really back to talking about true economics as opposed to the economics of, of uh, you know, providing taxpayer subsidies. Thank you both. Um, so we, I know we have um, a couple more questions that have been posed and just wanna give people a last opportunity. If you do have questions, feel free to type them into the chat or the Q&A and we can make sure to either address them here or if we run out of time, we can follow up with you and provide additional detail. Um, I also wanted to draw people's attention to the chat. So Ben has been uh, providing some links mm -hmm. to additional resources. Um, so please feel free to take a look at those and um, that will provide some more detail about the topics that we've covered here and our other research that's related to this line of inquiry. I see one more question in the Q&A, Joanne, from Kathy Ann. Did you want to... Yeah, so um, our the, the next question is, um, again, a follow up um, on Sandy's question from Kathy Ann Kowalski. Um, and this is, do renewables face some of the same challenges in realizing hyped economic benefits for jobs? Um, and then just for brevity's sake, I'll skip to the last part of the question, which is, Put another way, how could renewables avoid a lot of the disappointment that seems to follow from oil and gas related facilities? You know, I'd like to just call attention to um, a report that some of, I'm a, a finance professor at Bard's MBA in sustainability. And um, about two or three years ago, a group of students worked on a project and they looked at a wind farm in I think it was called Paulding County, Ohio. And what they found was that they had a 25 year consistent supply of money that came from a pilot program payment in lieu of taxes. And that was a very, very small county. And because it was a 25 year consistent revenue stream, the county was able to hire all sorts of personnel that had never been available with its budget before. The county had an upgrade in its credit facility. And if anybody knows anything about getting an upgrade with your Moody's rating, it's not easy to do. So there were economic benefits that perhaps were not visible. Um, I do share the concern that often it is construction workers, often they are from out of the area. They come, they build, they leave. And then um, it's not visible. Sometimes running these facilities are not done in the same place where the um, wind or the solar is generated. So that's a, a disappointment to people in the area. But I think there are economic benefits that are also not visible, such as um, revenue streams that can be realized at a level that you might not think that that in this particular case, they had hired a special ed teacher, they had hired, um, a DARE officer, DARE to stay off drugs or whatever that stands for, but they had ended up using the money um, at the local level. And it might not have been um, as obvious to the local residents where this additional uh, funding had been secured. So I do think the industry has to do, the renewable industry has to do a much better job of explaining how the economic benefits do reach the general public. Um, and I think that the industry can, can 
can can improve in that area? So it's a great question. In Texas, what they found in certain, even in one of the counties that is one of the biggest oil and gas producing counties in West Texas, they've said for the long haul, and regardless of where you stand on renewables, et cetera, et cetera, for, and just sheer job creation, for the long haul, the people in that area expected the uh, renewables industry, like the maintenance of the wind turbines, to uh, outlast and be more stable in terms of employment than oil and gas, because as you know, it is definitely boom and bust. And they're having a lot of trouble, uh, even with prices the way they are, they're having a lot of trouble finding workers because people just don't want to be uh, sitting out there in, you know, man camps for two and three weeks at a time <laughs> uh, for, you know, an uncertain future kind, kind of thing. And so that's that's how they're looking at renewables. And the other piece of it that we're just now taking on in Texas is that we have a lot of wind and solar. And right now, a considerable amount of that power is being used by Bitcoin mining. So that's an entirely other topic. But the bottom line for us is that the rest of the story is jobs that will be good jobs and uh, will be high skilled jobs in expanding and connecting the grid regardless of what kind of power we end up with. Whether it's a nuke or a windmill or whatever, we need higher and more reliable grid capacity and those, those will be very good jobs for the community. Great. In addition to renewable energy, we our researcher, Sean O'Leary, has been really interested in the localized economic impact and positive benefit of energy efficiency. So as a plug for future work, in the first quarter of next year, we'll be releasing an analysis with Ohio State University that looks at that in more detail and really tells the story of why investments in energy efficiency have a tendency to land more locally than um, investments, for example, in the oil and gas or petrochemical sector. So please keep a lookout for an invitation um, in early 2023 to learn more about that work. Well, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks to Ben Hunkler for arranging everything and for facilitating. And many thanks um, to Kathy Hippel and Ann Keller for your excellent work and for being here to engage in this discussion with us. Thank you, Joanne thank you and, all. and Kathy. Thank all of you. Thank it's you all. Thank you. Huh.